Jody, how does understanding cognitive conditions improve project outcomes when designing project management around the brain? So when you're looking at cognitive conditions, you're looking at how is the brain taking in information, avoiding information, missing information, overlooking information, adding information, being distracted by information. You're really looking at the filters, right, that the brain is using to create a outcome from the information. Project management for architects, engineers, and construction professionals is hard, and one of the hardest parts is interacting with people. In today's episode, we're going to cover a very interesting topic, behavioral project management, which focuses on how you can think about the way you think and how your brain works to be more effective as a project manager. My guests for today, Dr. Josh Ramirez and Dr. Jody Bull wilson are from the Institute for Neuro and Behavioral Project Management, and they have decades of experience in helping project teams really understand the importance of human behavior in driving project success. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's episode. I'm your host, Anthony Fasano, and this is the AEC Project Management Podcast. Now I'm excited to welcome our guests onto the show for today, Dr. Josh Ramirez and Dr. Jody Bull Wilson. Josh and Jody, welcome to the AEC Project Management Podcast. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So Josh and Jody, why don't we start off, and Jody, maybe you can go first. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved with behavioral project management. So I actually have a long history in working in the behavioral and social sciences, and Josh and I have had multiple conversations throughout the years, and he started asking me questions related to project management, and the funny story is that he asked me one day if I thought behavior had anything to do with this dilemma that he was having, and I literally said, well, if it has a brain, then yes, behavior has something to do with it. So that's kind of how I got introduced into the realm of project management. I've owned my own company, and I have done a lot of program management throughout the years, but it's really kind of honing into that project management side has been brought to, or I've been brought to that through Josh. That's awesome. And Josh, how about you? I, I started uh, in the project management space, primarily in mega projects and government, a lot of work in project controls, which is cost and schedule primarily. So I came into behavioral science from project management, whereas Jody came into project management from behavioral science and we just intersection kind of naturally occurred. But like Jody said, yeah, I would ask her questions and then I would go back and start Googling like crazy and she'd tell me about a bias and I'd look it up and then I'd find another bias and I'd look that up and then that just led down, you know, the rabbit hole, so to say, which led to essentially uh, me pursuing my PhD in, in behavioral science. My dissertation title was toward a theory of behavioral project management. So, and, and it kind of happened all really quickly was back in 2016, I think it was, I was in my behavioral economics class on a plane ride to Hawaii. And uh, it just hit me like, okay, behavioral economics exists. Behavioral finance exists. Is there a behavioral project management? And I just couldn't wait to land to Google it. And I, when we landed and I Googled it and it was pretty much non-existent. It hadn't been done yet. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe this has not been done yet, considering behavioral economics had been around for 20 years. And that just kind of launched everything. Josh, what is behavioral project management? And how does it differ from traditional project management approaches? Here to simplify it, its most basic foundation, it's that really the brain is involved in making every decision. And project management is really a thinking person's game. And so if you look at it from that lens, you realize that every decision we make is kind of processed through these filters of thought in our brain, so to say, and, and, and everything can be designed around the brain. So, you know, just to kind of blow some of the stereotypes out of the water, because, you know, kind of some of the questions we get, well, you know, 
what is behavioral project management? And sometimes the assumption is maybe, well, you know, it's leadership and, and emotional intelligence and good communication. And yes, behavioral project management includes those things, but it's actually way bigger than that. You can design software around the way people think. You can design your processes. You can design any kind of interface. You know, we have kind of basic four modalities in behavioral project management that we say, and with, that's interfaces such as software, processes, metrics, and skills. Most time people think of when they hear the word behavioral, you know, they kind of think more, you know, soft skills, psychology, sit on the couch, tell me how you feel. But it's actually bigger than that in that the skills portion is only one slice of that. Jody, how does understanding cognitive conditions improve project outcomes when designing project management around the brain? So when you're looking at cognitive conditions, you're looking at how is the brain taking in information, avoiding information, missing information, overlooking information, adding information, being distracted by information. You're really looking at the filters, right, that the brain is using to create a outcome from the information. So for example, one of my favorites is ostrich effect. That's where we attend to avoid information. Either we have cognitive overload and we are getting too much information and we just have to shut things down and be like, I can't take any more in. Or it's, yeah, I don't want to look at that. Sometimes specifically we run into with data Individuals can be on a project and there will be data points that they don't necessarily want to look at because they either don't want to deal with it, they don't like what it's telling them, which could be, hey, it's time to course correct or pivot here. Or it could be, no, you're completely, you're completely right, keep going type thing. They have a tendency to really put additional information in these buckets as far as whether or not it can be utilized, not utilized, whether they whether the it's too much for them to take in in that moment, or whether it is that piece of validating. So when we look at confirmation bias, we look for information that validates what we have already thought. Sometimes the information's there and we run with it, but sometimes we filter out information that is important, but we don't want to look at it because it doesn't confirm the direction that we're going. Josh, can you explain the concept of cognitive moderators or filters of thinking and how they impact decision-making in projects? Uh, so Jody kind of touched on when you were asking about conditions and, and basically what it is, is so if we think about biases, for example, let's just use this real quick. We usually hear of cognitive biases like optimism bias or confirmation bias, et cetera. Those are kind of like symptoms if you if you kind of want to oversimplify, so to say. What we're interested in is is what's the underlying cause of the cognitive bias? And many times, and in most cases, it's it's for the most part, it's always heuristics. But then there's other things like psychological safety and time pressure and cognitive dissonance and cognitive load and decision fatigue. Right? All of those things kind of act as like filters that may prevent all the information from coming through, right? And so time pressure is one of the biggest ones, especially in project management, because as we all know, you know, project management is, is, is defined as a temporary endeavor to deliver a product or service. And that temporariness, if that's a word, um, creates time pressure. That time constraint creates time pressure. Well, time pressure actually causes more heuristic thinking or defaulted thinking. So it's the automatic mode of the brain. I think neuroscientists kind of refer to it as the default mode in research. And so what it does is it causes us to default to what the brain thinks it knows. And it's instantaneous, right? So if I say two plus two, you say four. And if I say 367 times 1054, you say... I have no I idea. got to get a calculator, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so, so that two plus two is is a perfect example of of system one. You just know the answer, you don't think about it. So, 
heuristics, you can also think of it this way. If you're in a um, Google page and you start typing in the search bar, it starts using predictive text and automatically starts giving you suggestions of what it thinks you may want to be searching for, right? So your brain kind of automatically does the same thing in the background. And so, you know, as soon as you have a word association, you see something, you think of something, you're having a conversation, your brain's automatically processing information. And so that's kind of heuristics. And so the, the issue with time pressure is that time pressure causes more heuristic or automatic thinking. And with that comes more um, reliance on cognitive biases for decision making. So that's just one example. Another one, you know, psychological safety, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is actually an underlying cause in many, in many times of the ostrich effect like Jody was talking about or optimism bias. So when you say time pressure, is that just like you're up against a deadline essentially? Or Pretty multiple. much, yeah. <laughs> okay, or multiple, yeah. yeah, true, right? Yeah, or multiple okay. deadlines. Okay, okay, interesting. You can but, also experience but, time pressure and social pressure concurrently like in a meeting, for example. Right. So multiple at one time. Where you're also talking about people in training and looking at time pressure. So if you say you went to a weekend workshop, right? The weekend boot camp kind of scenario, you did your five days during the week, then Saturday, Sunday, you're also spending time doing your training for your PMP. And then Monday, you're back at it again your brain really isn't getting a chance to kind of go into neutral, so to speak, or to disengage. You're purposefully keeping it as engaged as possible, and the brain will fatigue from that. And so that piece of you just, the time pressure is really the amount of time being forced to be engaged. Does that same example, Jody, apply to like a single day? Like if you were oh, yeah. going all day, your brain would just, whereas it's better to build yeah. in some breaks. Right. And so there's research around that element with, um, I don't know if you're familiar with people who have looked at doing like the four day work week yes. or research around like productivity and you really, and honestly, especially when it comes to high thought process work or what we call like the, the thought process. What is it, Josh? The thought, you use this term all the time. I'm forgetting it. Sorry. Um, like requires a lot of mental know, intensity or Well, the thought, thought economy, process. right? As far as okay. it's the it's people who have to generate a lot of information. They have to use a lot of thought content. Um, they also have to use a lot of brain power to do a an deep analysis work. And that type of content fatigue comes into play. But folks essentially can do that for about six hours. And that's not six hours continuously. That's six hours in a day. So essentially, you really need to have those kind of productivity moments. There was a rather than time management concept, there was an energy management concept. So there are some people who do really well with doing complex work and high energy work first thing in the morning, and then they need time to disengage. So like the individuals who aren't taking a lunch, they really need to take that lunch, take that break, because then when they come back after lunch, that's a second peak in their mental capacity. So a lot of times we look at it from that perspective of some people kind of get up and they're ready to dive in. Those people should wait to take care of any like emailed nuances, right? Like don't sit there and scroll through your emails and respond yes, no, let me attach this file kind of information at those peak moments for yourself. And so what you're looking for is really noting when you have that high energy availability with your brain and that high content availability with your brain and really set up your day and your time to those high functioning elements. Um, then also recognizing a lot of times people will note about three or four o'clock in the afternoon, they start to disengage, they start to get tired, 
they, you know, when are you trying to grab for caffeine, right? Is it first thing right. in the morning? Is it after lunch? Is it that three to four o'clock time frame? Those are the indicators that you really need to kind of take that quick break. The breaks don't have to be long. It can literally be just a get up, walk around for a few minutes, but walk away from the computer, walk away from your screens yeah. and settle that down. And that, and when you say like those peak times for you, it sounds like this is something that's different for every person. Yeah. I mean, you have individuals who work really well late at night. You have individuals who work really well early in the morning. Um, it's just noting when is your fatigue time. And Jody, how can project managers apply behavioral design principles to enhance team performance and project delivery? So with behavioral design, you're really looking for those elements. What we focus on a lot with our behavioral design is the interface element. Behavioral design from that interface element of what information are you being given? What prompts are you being given? How are you interacting with the interface? That has been more of where we have focused in on behavioral design, not necessarily behavioral design on team building, if I'm, if I'm understanding your co question correctly. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's, that's exactly right. And again, you can see as we go through the conversation here that use the term high leverage. I mean, if you're paying attention to these when you're designing programs, you're designing the way you work during the day, during the week, these are all going to have a huge impact for you, for your project managers, because, you know, I would say the brain is relatively important <laughs> when it comes to <laughs> the type of work that we do in, in managing our projects. So, Josh, what role do pressure, process, and people play in the success or failure of a project? And how can managers navigate these factors? And I know you talked a little bit about time pressure, but I think process and people are also things that the firms we work with are constantly thinking about in their PM efforts. First of all, I think the people thing is kind of already built in if you think about behavioral project management as a whole. So it, we kind of use that as the underlying concept for everything. When it comes to process, this is kind of back to the behavioral design conversation, but the whole idea of process is that every single process that we work with can be tweaked so that we capture more information, we make better decisions, etc. Even the sequence of steps that we take. So for example, you should do risk before uh, you should analyze risk before you even estimate a duration or estimate resources, for example, because of the anchoring effect in the brain, right? Which is a cognitive bias as well. So the sequence in which you do things is important. The type of questions that you ask can be built into the process. So for example, a big one that we talk about a lot or a couple of big ones we talk about a lot is uh, unpacking, which is essentially, you know, taking a, a component and breaking it down into its sub parts. And then the, another one is obstacle identification, which is essentially you're identifying the obstacles to activity completion prior to estimating, you know, the quantity of resources or how long something will take. Once again, the sequence in which you even ask the question about obstacle identification is important. So I want to ask about obstacles prior to quantifying the resources or the duration, right? So... If you were to think about the PMBOK as a you know very simple example, the PMBOK says you know do this step and then do this step and this step. Yet those are those are correct. What the PMBOK may be missing in some cases is is the cognitive strategy built into the process in order to get more reliable information, right? So it's one thing to just say just say go identify risk. Well, well it's another from a cognitive strategy to say when do you identify risk and how do you ask the question. And do you also identify obstacles? And you know, I often get the question, well, you know, I'm already identifying risk. Why should I identify obstacles? And I'll tell you, well, to the brain, that's a very different question. Because a lot of what behavioral science studies is how people process risk information. And when you ask about a risk, you know, typically we think of things that may or may not occur. And usually those things are not 
positive, right? It's what bad things can occur that can, can slow the project. Well, when I ask about risk, it gives me a potential out. In other words, um, if I say, well, what's the probability that this bad thing may occur? Well, it's a probability question, which means um, it may or may not occur. And if I'm op very overly optimistic, I might say, assign a low probability to it and say, well, you know, this thing, bad thing may or may not occur. I'm going to say, we're probably okay. We'll just assign a low probability to it, right? And so risk thinking is different than, obst than thinking about obstacles because obstacles are events that will occur, right? So if I ask a question about obstacles, I'm saying what things are going to get in the way versus what things may get in the way. And if I ask the may question, essentially what I'm doing is um, introducing potential cognitive dissonance or um, fear of bad things occurring. And that introduces a whole host of cognitive biases, such as uncertainty, aversion, and ostrich effect, and all kinds of other things. So there's so much that has to be embedded in the whole process concept. And when we look at obstacles, a lot of times we're also assessing for interdependencies. And uh, some people won't see the interdependencies in and of themselves until you ask what the obstacle is. And some people will not see the obstacle until you ask what the interdependency is. So sometimes, you know, we're asking this a similar question in different ways in order to give the brain and the team the opportunity to take it another layer down or to do another level of discovery. So talking about discovery, let me bring up real quick. I did a, a pilot study where we found that about 65% of all the um, delays in a group of projects were actually pre predictable and preventable. And so when you pull the string on that, you find out it wasn't because they were optimistic. It was because they missed the information. And the question is, is, why did you miss the information, right? So we have a whole lot more predictability in projects than we think we do, but we usually assign it to, oh, you know, this thing popped up and I couldn't have pre predicted it or prevented it. And the answer is, in many cases, you could have. And so something like unpacking, for example, causes us to come out of system one, the default mode, and into system two and start to think of things that may occur, think of more scope, think of more risk, think of more resources, et cetera. It's interesting. I mean, I think one of the big takeaways for me from all of this is there are some generally accepted frameworks out there, right? The five process groups, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, and controlling, and closing out your project. But within each of those groups is a lot of steps, and the way that you approach those steps should really be more calibrated to the way you think. Right. And that the, can be the way something all humans think. Yeah. The way all <laughs> humans think. Yeah. Yeah. And as a PM, you really should be considering that when you approach your projects, you know, with you, yes. with your team, as opposed to just going through the standard framework every time. Yes. And there are, you know, there are great things in all frameworks. And, and I'd have to add this point of clarification, behavioral project management does not look to replace agile. It does not look to replace waterfall or any other right. project management methodology out there. All it does is it provides a scientific foundation from the perspective of the brain on how you can enhance the existing processes in those methodologies. Great. No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, Jody, neural plan seems to be a significant tool in your work. What is it and how does it align with the principles of neurobehavioral project management? So neural plan is the training and the NPPQ is the certification process that we have in which specifically for the planning element of projects, we've gone through and looked at and created a certification that will help you make improvements in the planning of your project using the neural and behavioral components that we've uncovered. 
Additionally, a lot of people have found that after taking the training, that there are elements with that that they are able to go through and utilize in different areas of their projects as well. But really, when we were breaking everything down with behavior and neuro and everything, neurological aspects, we needed a starting place. And the neuro plan is our starting place, which we have then built out from there. But that is really the, if you want to go get the bang for your buck and learn how to do a lot of the behavioral project management and the NPPQ is the certification that will help you take it to that next level. So One just step- on that, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, Josh, just following up yeah. on what you said before, I'm wondering if this ties into what Jody just described is what you said about trying to be more considered, like what you said about the 65% the problems being more recognized in the planning stages. Is that what the neural plan assists with? Yes. Yeah. Because we look at it from a, it's not just a process perspective. It's also an environment perspective. It's a conditions perspective, right? So essentially neural plan is behavioral project management with a focus on prediction. And so um, we've put most of all the research that's, you know, ready to be applied into neural plan. Um, And so and when you think of, I have to do, offer a point of clarification here, you know, when we think of plan, we say the word plan in project management space, we typically think of the word uh, or the concept of the initial target or baseline, right? Initiating, planning, executing, closing. Yep. Planning comes before execution. Well, from a plan perspective, we're actually looking at anything to do with prediction. So once you start execution, you continue to make predictions during forecasting, right? You're still continuing to make predictions on updates to resources, updates to schedule. So neural plan continues to be applicable even into the execution phase. Which anyone that's worked on an engineering project before knows that that makes sense because your project, no matter what stage you're in, is always <laughs> subject to yeah. a lot of variation and a lot of changes. Yeah. So I think our listeners would appreciate that. So Josh, can you share any other kind of real world examples where behavioral project management has led to significant project improvements? Yeah. So we uh, did a pilot study on a bunch of projects over about a five to six month period and we applied some of the concepts from behavioral PM and, and neural plan. And we got about an 80% improvement in um, planning accuracy. In other words, the on-time delivery improved by 80%. So to give that context, they started off on an average of being 50% optimistic from month to month and went down to about 10% optimistic. So they got better at predicting um there's also so they became more accurate it got a lot more accurate right and but there's also a cost savings component to that because if you predict more accurately what you're doing is you're predictively coordinating the resources to be at the same place at the same time to do the work right and so there's an efficiency a factor there's an efficiency factor associated with good prediction and a perfect example is the other pilot study i did that found that's the 65 percent um, the delays were predictable. Some of the examples there um, from a real world perspective were, you know, the prior week they made a forecast and said, we're, you know, we're going to be at site A next week and team one will be there, you know, eight o'clock in the morning. Well, team one shows up next week and uh, on, on site A and there's a team B is already there. And so they can't, so team or team one can't perform where team two is already there because they're in the same physical space, right? So what does team one do? Well, they were supposed to be on site and the forecast said that schedule forecast that they were supposed to be there, but now they can't do work. Well, what do they do? They have to redeploy to another project if they can redeploy to another project, right? So let's just say a minimum downtime of a day and then they, you know, go to another project. Well, there's a cost associated with that. You know, you got six people that are down for a day, eight hours a day, hundred bucks an hour, you know, do the math. You got several thousand dollars of, of waste. And so there's cost associated with bad planning and bad forecasting and, and generally speaking, bad prediction, optimistic prediction. 
It's very interesting because, you know, I think anyone, I use the, the term loosely, anyone, but could predict maybe something within 50% plus or minus, right? But if you're starting to get down to 10%, like you suggest, you're honing in much closer, you're much more accurate, and that can reduce some of the extraneous time efforts, wasted, I should say, time and efforts that would happen if you're not within that 10%. So if you can do that more, obviously across an organization, especially with the, the size and complexity, I think of these architecture, engineering, construction projects that we see, which could be hundreds of million dollar projects. Now you're really amplifying the savings and the return on that which is, I'm sure, exciting. Yeah, we estimate somewhere between the 6 and 20, 21% range wow. in cost savings. Depending upon how okay. your team performs, right? So if you have a team that... Yeah, we have a lot of variables. Right. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. I, there's always variables, but I think generally speaking, in the infrastructure world, you know, the size of these projects and the price tag on them makes some of the improvements that you've suggested today can certainly be a substantial improvements in the terms of dollars, hours, energy, et cetera, which is why project management is great to invest in. Yeah. And if you look at the amount of time and even just a small, how small some of the specifically from Neuroplan, if you look at how small some of the recommendations are, they're really just tweaks right? They are really just tweaking something, asking one question differently and making a big change in your forecasting month over month. So it's really this element of it doesn't take a lot of effort and it doesn't cost a lot of money to see big returns. That's awesome. By the way, behavioral science is, is kind of that way in general. It's very sometimes very subtle tweaks and sometimes it doesn't even involve very much training on, you know, biases or anything. The, the one example I'm using, you know, where we got the 80% improvement, I never trained them on cognitive biases or optimism biases. I just tweaked the processes. So you just modified their process and they used a new process and they got that kind of return on it. Yes. Right. Hmm. That's interesting. All right. I have time for one last question and you can both certainly answer this one. Jody, I'll start with you on it. How can AEC professionals incorporate these behavioral principles into their daily project management practices? We talked a lot about a lot of stuff here, and I'm sure that they can get overwhelmed with a lot of it, but what are some kind of takeaways, key things they can do from what we talked about? Um, th just following up on where our conversation was in the last question, really look for those small tweaks, Right. And really look for the the minimal things that make the biggest difference. So where we've talked about cognitive fatigue, that type of thing, take that step back. 15 minutes of disengagement as far as getting off the screen, stand up, walk around, go get a drink of water, take your lunch, do not skip that. Those elements can really have a big impact on how you will perform overall. Additionally, there are very specific tweaks like how you ask questions. Are you asking probing questions? Are you unpacking? Who's unpacking? Did you Do you need to take a, a moment and unpack even for 15 minutes versus having a really large meeting with 15 people? Do you need to, you know, just take these pieces and say, okay, if I unpack this a little bit more, I'm finding that we have an obstacle here that we haven't already identified. Is that something you can take care of? Is that something you need to take back to the team? Really just taking those micro moments, to me, 15 minutes is a micro moment, taking those micro moments to look at something differently, engage the brain in a different way or disengage, go into neutral, can have a big impact. That's great. Josh, final thoughts? Never ask how long something will take. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes that we make in project management. The schedule drives everything. It drives the initial baseline to which we measure against, and it drives cost, right? That very question of how long do you think this will take 
is probably the worst question you can ask when terms of making a reliable duration in your schedule. And the reason being is because the brain is just goes to heuristics to come up with a number. You need to derive the duration from something such as resource availability, unpacking first. So plan from right to left. Now work your way backwards. Unpack your scope, which will discover more risk. Ask about the obstacles before quantifying, and then quantify the resources and divide that up by availability. So for example, you know, is the person working eight hours a day or is the person working four hours a day on this? You know, and that can mean the difference between a 20 day duration or a 40 day duration. So basically what I'm saying is you derive your duration from something. You don't ask how long something will take. That's great. That's a great summary. Well, I want to thank Jody and Josh for spending some time with us on the podcast today. You can learn more about the Institute for Neuro and Behavioral Project Management by visiting their website at behavioralpm.com. And of course, you can connect with both Josh and Jody on LinkedIn. And again, I want to thank you both for spending some time with us on the podcast and for all the work that you've done here. Um, it's, it's great stuff and I'm excited to share it with our listeners. Thanks so much for having us. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed the conversation here today, thinking about behavioral project management and how making some modifications to your processes to better align with the way you think and the way your brain works seems to be kind of obvious, but probably something that a lot of people just don't do. And I hope that you can apply some of these strategies to your PM efforts. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to our channel here. We do put out videos like this on a weekly basis to help engineers become better project managers and leaders. I'll see you next week.